Oh my gosh. I just love the music. It just makes me feel, I don't know, present or something. Ready to go. Like, like I, yeah, exactly. Like I got a big present. Um, so today we're really excited um, on our show today. We're going to talk about community and building um, building groups and communities that sustain us um, for um, for our whole life, our whole life, right? And my guest is Mary Persall, and she will be joining us. I mean, she is here in the studio, which is very exciting. And But before we start our conversation, I just want to um, talk a minute about some really cool stuff that's happening with um, the magazine. And we've been working on the cover, and it has been quite an experience because our... Our um, uh, focus, well, the focus this whole this whole year is going to be a real is really around taking a deep dive into self care, and self care can be so many things, um, and it's going to be different for each person, and it's really really important because what I keep hearing is health is a new wealth, and if you don't have your health, and we see it all over the place, uh, you really don't have much. And right, Mary, yeah, <laughs> right? So the, um, and just people are, um, I don't know what it is, but it seems like there's more sick people around lately than even ever in the past couple of years. And it's just a constant reminder how important it is to be healthy. So like I said, just some really cool stuff happening. There's some detoxes happening in February, which we'll be talking about next week. And, um, then the cover and just coming to terms with, you know, what, what deep self-care really is. And one of the things that, um, where Mary and I are going to talk about is community is there's so much anxiety. Um, the anxiety and depression and mental health issues are off the flipping charts right now. And, um, are you seeing that Mary? Absolutely. It's um, everywhere you look that you hear about people are having anxiety and um, how to deal with it. And so I know Mary's got an amazing story and um, (coughs) used to be, what could you say that you used to be high anxiety or high anxiety anxiety. anxiety. and, and you found ways to work through it and, and um, very successfully work through it. And so can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, first, I'd like to say, as far as health goes, that before I started the group that we're first going to talk about, I almost killed myself with my thoughts. I believe emotional health is just as vital mm. as everyday health. And I was it was a heartbreak. I was had a broken heart, and I just dwelled on it and dwelled on it and dwelled on it until my stomach was filled with peritonitis, and I had to be operated on. And it was a big turnaround for me because I realized the power of my thoughts and how destructive they could be. I didn't intentionally do it, but that is what happened. So my emotional health was in such a state that it brought my physical body down and the surgery enabled me to be alive again. The near-death experience of surgery, it was a very intense moment in my calendar of days. Uh, uh, did there, was there something, like, because we hear about that, people will have something, it, and it seems like it's always, there's always some crisis, right, um, that that pushes us to do something different. And it doesn't matter whether it's professionally or personally or whatever. But then you hear about people that have the crisis, but they don't then, they go back to their old ways. So what, what was different for you that made you say, ah, I'm going to do something different? What was different for me as was that I knew I had done it. I knew that I had brought it on myself. How I, did you know that? Because I'd been so locked up in this man or this relationship, relationship. the thoughts of this relationship that I just dwelled on it and dwelled on it. I didn't eat right. I didn't sleep right. I literally just dwelled on it until my body couldn't take it anymore, and it was like an explosion, really. Wow. So, <laughs> so, so you went through the surgery, and then while you were healing, did you say, how did you come to um, what was going to make you feel better? Well, the doctor came in and said he was sorry 
because he didn't know what was wrong. He didn't have a reason for why that had happened. And I told him not to worry because I knew. I knew why it happened. And he, he was baffled and didn't believe it. But I did know because of the thoughts that were in my head. And I was terrified. I was terrified to leave the hospital. I was just terrified because of what I had brought on myself. And I just knew it. I knew it because of the way my my poisonous thoughts for the prior year just became poison in my stomach. So I was lying in the hospital, afraid to go home, didn't want to talk to anybody or do anything. I had I had no communication with hardly anybody the whole prior year. I was just alone and isolating and getting sicker. And a lady came by, and she had a card of books, and she asked me, would I like a book? And I said, no, instinctively. Because <laughs> you like to read. Because I, so, I was so used to saying no. Okay. And then I said, well, what kind of books do you have? What do you mean? And she said, oh, we have free books, and you can just take them, and you can read them and as long as you want. And, and she had this book on there that was called Love is Letting Go of Fear by Gerald Jimpolsky. And it was all about the Course in Miracles. And it was all about... I am responsible for the world I see. And other lessons like that, I think maybe he'd taken 20, 12 of the 365 lessons and he put them in a little book. And it was the first thing that had made sense to me in as long as I could remember. And it did make sense, and I knew that I was responsible for my world, but I didn't know how to change my thoughts. Okay. And so this was all about undoing your thoughts, undoing your uh, wrong thinking and changing it to right thinking. Just turning it all around, really. It's the opposite of the world's way of thinking, and it's a more inward-directed thinking. Okay. And so so then what would you do? I finished reading that book, and I wanted the real book. I wanted and so you went home. Oh, I went yeah. home. Yeah, okay. I went home, and I, I read the book at home, <laughs> Okay, actually. I took the book home with okay. me. And I wanted a real, I wanted to know about the real Course in Miracles that this book had been devised from. And there was a retreat in Olivet where they would be studying A Course in Miracles. And so I signed up for the five-day retreat in Olivet. And one of the things was A Course in Miracles. I, si- I wasn't going to sign up for it because it was only three days, and the friend said, oh, do something you can really get into. And I thought, yeah, and then I decided to sign up for it, and it was just three days long. And uh, there was 300 people at the retreat probably, and there was only about six people in the Course in Miracles group. It was very new at the time. And one lady was there, and she said, oh, I got the Course in Miracles last year, and I did a lesson a day every day for the whole past year, and after a few weeks, the Holy Spirit took over, and here I am, a new person, and she would play on the piano, and I thought, hmm, I can do that. I can do that, and then I took the book home, and I started doing a lesson, one lesson a day, which they were very short at first, and reading the textbook, which I just read continuously. And I was a test driver at General Motors, and I would had the whole thing on tape, and I would listen to it, listen to it constantly, and I was so convinced that the world had made me crazy, or I would have nothing to do with regular radio or anything. I just stuck right to, I had the Bible on tape, and I listened to the Bible and the Course in Miracles, and did a lesson a day, and they were so short, you didn't hardly notice them, and then they started building and getting longer, and I had a lot, a lot of resistance to doing them. I okay. wanted to burn the book at one point. <laughs> I threw it. I took it and just threw it across the room because it was so frustrating because it was changing my whole thought system around from being an outwardly directed thought system and other people being responsible to an inwardly directed uh, that's, system that's where the I ascent, right? am responsible, right. correct. Right. So instead of blaming the world or the circumstances of the world or whatever, we take mm-hmm. responsibility. Exactly. So, okay, so then 
So fast forward a little bit. So I did, I did get through the whole year, and I was drastically changed, and I was happy and productive and living life normally again. And I went to, but I'd done it myself the whole year. I didn't have any groups. I just was driven to do it myself. And then I was at the health food store, a little tiny one, the first one ever in town a lot of years ago. And the girl, Karen, that was working there said she had been reading A Course in Miracles and that she really wished there was a group that she could go to to help her understand it. And I said, I could do that. I could start a group. And I did and started meeting every Sunday at the Wisdom Tree, which is right on Main Street in Brighton at first. And people would come and go and come and go and study and we would meditate together and sit together and solve problems together, solve life issues together so that we have a more enlightened view of what's happening in our circle, in our circumstances. So that's um, so it's grown from that, and that was how many years has this group been in existence now? Um, over thirty-five. It was back in the early nineties. So wow. Okay. Early nineties. And and from that, you've gotten the opportunity to create a, a core group that mm-hmm. um, is a safe place to have conversation, Absolutely. which has Absolutely. been really helpful in this past couple years right absolutely i think it's always been a safe place to have conversations but when the same people keep coming back over and over again there's a bonding that occurs and a trust that develops um the first 20 years or so it was just different people coming and going and being here for as long as they needed to to calm down and to meditate and to pray and to take their mind off the world, and people would come and go, stay for years or just once or weeks. And then about the last 10 years, has it been 10 years, Sherry? Yeah, probably. It's been really consistent. 10 or 12. It's been the same core group, you among them. And um, we meet every Sunday. And now through this pandemic, we, we meet on Zoom. And it's it's basically just the same thing, really. It's not as good but we still can pray together we can still meditate together we still read holy scriptures together and study and and get a more enlightened approach to what's going on in between between sunday to sunday i think one of the things that's so lovely about and i mean i just look at you know my best friends have been my best friends since i was 12 Right. Um, You know, we met the first day of cheerleading camp when we were in seventh grade is when you have consistency, whether it's a group or friends or um, I don't know, we'll talk about some of the other groups you're in. Over time, you go through so many of life's ups and downs together, right, together. And there's just something I, I think at the end of the day. Isn't that the best thing in life? Mm-hmm. Is sharing life with other people, mm-hmm. and, and that's what saved me because I w- had been isolating so much prior to that time. Because I, if I couldn't love that man, I wasn't going to love anybody. And it was the community that ended up developing from that that has turned into my rock. Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of that feeling like no matter what happens, COVID come what may, you know, (laughs) or all of the things, Mm -hmm. but there's these people that you can say whatever to, not in a, not in a, um, a, an abusive mean way, it's not that, it's really more you can speak what's, what's coming up in your mind and your head, and there's a a process or a structure or a support Mm -hmm. to help work through it. Exactly. And um, since Thich Nhat Hanh passed, I've been listening to a lot of his oh, things that, and lately. Oh, he's the Buddhist monk? The Buddhist, Buddhist monk, monk, yeah, right. who came here in the 70s or 60s trying to stop the Vietnam War. He's from Vietnam, and he got exiled from his country, and he just passed lately. But I've been studying him a lot and listening to him, and they were asking him questions. And someone said, my friend is really distraught and... and he has a two-year-old, and his mother has dementia, and his wife has is 
pulling on him, and he's real frustrated, and he wanted me to ask you, what should he do? And the very first thing he said was Sangha. He said he needs a community. Is that what Sangha means? Yes. Yeah, sangha okay, means, Sangha means exactly. community. Okay. Thank you. Okay, right. <laughs> but that was his first response, that to, in order to hold all that, in order to contain all that he's going through, he needs a community of people to talk to, to to sound off to, to help him understand and help him relate to the rest of things. So even, you know, in all parts of the world, that community it's is the same. vital. It's right. vital. Right, and it's been that way since time began. Exactly. Right? I mean, you read, you read the um, philosophers and, and the their wisdom, the things they say about p- community. Exactly. Is, um, yeah. So, so technology hasn't, <laughs> <laughs> technology's changed the way we communicate some, but it hasn't changed our need for community. Exactly. Right. It's enhanced the way we can communicate. Right, right. The groups that I'm most involved with now are all on Zoom. All on it's Zoom, okay. People all over the world. So, so talk a little bit about that. So, um, last March, I, participated in a two-month online course with Natalie Goldberg, who wrote wrote Writing Down the Bones, and she's been a writing teacher for years and years, but that's a gift from the pandemic, actually, because she only did things in person, and now she's she's forced to go online. So she has a writing practice, it's called, and... It's where you get together and you you write, and then you read to each other, and you sit first, of course. You sit first. And then there's no feedback. There's no good. There's no bad. There's no right. There's no wrong. And you just thank the person afterwards. And it's a, it's a chance for them to develop their own voice and their own thoughts, and you're just there to be a listener. S- okay, so so you... Um, log into Zoom, mm-hmm. and then do you write for a while? Or we, you we usually sit, we meditate for a while, maybe 10 minutes. Okay. We get silent together because okay. that's the salvation of everything, I think. R- right. No, and I agree with you. for all the distractions that are going on in the world, we just sit and we l- listen to the quiet for a while together, ring a bell. And then when that's over, we pick a topic and we write on a topic. For all of us write on the same topic, but you don't have to write what's in your heart and you just write and you force the pen to keep going across the page you just do not stop you keep even if you can't think of what to say you keep saying I remember I remember I remember and you do it for 10 minutes or 15 minutes and now I have some groups that we write up to an hour okay at a time and just keep forcing it and it's it goes very quickly but then there's a real trust among the people that they're not going to respond that they're just going to listen wholeheartedly. And that's another thing that Thich Nhat has been saying lately, is that listening is how you heal each other. So oh, just I love that. deeply, deep listening. And that's how he tries to get the world to, countries to communicate with each other, to just listen, not to just listen. And that as you listen... You learn. You learn about your own perceptions as you learn about their perceptions. And then you can create a harmony. You can create a balance between that. You don't go into it thinking you're right or wrong or anything. You just listen. And the healing occurs by just deep listening because everybody just wants to be heard. Right. Everybody wants to be valued. It's And it's so interesting. Like um, we were talking about those times when somebody says something and you get that, you know, you like, out in your hair in the back of your neck goes up or whatever. But but when we can just listen, even to our bodies, okay, mm-hmm. so my body is reacting this way to mm-hmm. what this person's saying, what's really going on here, right? Mm-hmm. And so often, um, if, we can, if we can just do that, mm-hmm. we learn so much, like you said, about exactly. ourselves. Exactly. And we're so used to responding, and we're so used to being responded to. We're right. used to sit, you're, we're used to being told, "Oh, good job" or "bad job," and we're used to telling people too. So that's a practice in itself, just remaining silent and and deeply listening 
And just being really present with the person. Present for the person. And And in the moment. Yeah, and then you get the same people come back week after week, and you get to know them. And everybody has ups and downs. Everybody has highs and lows. Everybody has all the emotions. And it's a chance to express them. And it's a chance to get them out of your system and on paper and make you more aware of what you're thinking. Thinking. So there's um, uh, one of the gifts that I gave myself this January, the winter. It's cold, right? And mm-hmm. so it's like, let's have the winter experience. And I love to read. Um, I love And I love fiction, but I never read it because I just don't make allow the time to do it. So I thought, okay, it's winter. It's hibernate mm-hmm. a little, so I'm going to read fiction. And one of my friends... Uh, suggested this books and um, I'm going to totally get the title wrong. One of them is the the sec- secret life of Queenie Hennessy, and then the other one is the on um, something incredible journey. Of That's right, the incredible journey. Of, of of did you read fried. those? Yeah. Did, so yeah. so I've been reading those and I've been fascinated by how and and it's not like deep reading. Like some of the books that are so uh, heavy, um, and is profound mm-hmm. in its way, right? Yes, it is. But but to your point about um, that listening, because the two books are about the same circumstances from different perspectives, mm-hmm. which is fascinating how different they are, right? The perspective, and also how easy it is for us to assume that just because a person looks like this or does this, that's who they are. Exactly. Where they c- they're so different mm-hmm. and so much deeper and so much more interesting and complicated and all those things, uh, but you only find that by listening. Exactly. And fiction is the most empathetic people read fiction because fi- fiction teaches you to be empathetic. It teaches you to see all sides. So I never heard that before, but um, I knew that if that um, people who read like th- they want th- um, uh, in courts or juries, mm-hmm. they want people who read on a jury because their minds are more open. Exactly. Right. They have a lot more experiences. Exactly. So for those same reasons, because they can see all the different points of view. And so they have a bigger perspective of that. That that's fascinating, Mary. I love that. So, <laughs> you so read more fiction. Yeah, now. read more fiction. So maybe it'll be you know that's part of my self care uh-huh. is that time uh, reading got me. Well, we've talked about this. Yes. Reading got me through life. Exactly. It's always gotten me through life. And when my kids were little and they wanted something, they go, "Mom, you can sit and read." <laughs> <laughs> and there's they a Starbucks lo- close. You can get a coffee and read while we do you know whatever we oh, want to do. Great. So they that's bribed great. and. Um, that's another thing our reading groups are doing now. Ray Bradbury, you've heard of Ray Bradbury, that's science fiction. He, uh, he recommends that you don't try to write a novel because it takes a whole year to write a novel and it might not be any good. And he recommends that every night you read a short story, an essay, and a poem before you go to sleep. All three? All three. Okay. Every night you read. In the old ones, he said, too, with all the metaphors, so that the more you read, the more those metaphors will turn into your own metaphors on the page. And so we have a group of people who are doing that each each night on their own, whatever they want to read, and then we get together once a week to read our story that we have written or our essay or our poetry. And one uh-huh. night even uh, a lady sang us a song that she'd written. Wow. It, it, it's an awesome experience because, like, we're doing it on our own, but we're doing it together. Right, right. And it's, um, I, I love that idea, right? Because we've gotten so, I don't know, away from all of that. Mm-hmm. We, we just watch Netflix mm-hmm. or we do other stuff and we don't tap into those parts of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, huh. I. Huh? I got rid of my cable television. Did you? Yes, I did. <laughs> well, I'm not there yet, and I. Uh, but but most I. Most people but I'm are. I never was a big television watcher in the first place, and then, and I didn't even have one for years. And my mom says you have to have a television, so she got me one, and I had one, and then I kind of got hooked on it, off and on over the years, and 
I I'm more of a creative that likes to bring Did stuff out of me than I've been reading and watching then for years, and it's time to express more express for more. me. Got it, got it. Well, I, if I lived by myself, I would do more reading. I just, <laughs> <laughs> that's, um, so you, the other groups that you found where you've got connection is what, with um, dogs? I have and, in the past. And art, mm-hmm. and those have been, um, because in some ways, there's like groups everywhere, but mm-hmm. it can be, it can be overwhelming and, and, um, a, and then groups can have their own agenda, yes, right? Exactly. And I've noticed that too. And that can not, and that can be really kind of icky. I haven't had too much experience with that, honestly, but I think the key is to find people who with common interests. Kind of that's where it starts. That's how yeah, you start it organically. That's how it, start. right. that's how it starts or- organically. And um, now I'm with all the writing people. When I was with the, the dog rescue, it was all people who loved dogs and wanted to rescue dogs. And I was a foster mom for dogs for years and years. But then you are you have a common purpose. You have a common goal. Right, right. And it's, and it again, it's not... Um, I don't want to say creepy because when you can go like in business, you go to a networking group and it can just be really uncomfortable and awkward mm-hmm. because there's not like something that you can start with. Okay. Where if you start with because you love dogs and you're rescuing dogs, you have an immediate problem right there to solve or, solve or issue. Exactly. So people jump in where they are. Mm-hmm. So, well, good, Mary. So that's, um, uh, it's a, yeah, it's, it's, it gets, comes back to how we can support each other mm-hmm. as we go through lives, mm-hmm. through our lives, in a way that is, I mean, honor the other person, mm-hmm. right? But allow the other person to be who they are. Exactly. Yeah. And I think when you're in groups like that where you do that, you, you're you more capable and you're more able to be like that when you go out into the world. Like our Sunday morning is just a soft place to land and we can be together and we can go through our weeks and we can pray together and we can elevate our thinking and we can turn things right around you can come with a problem and you can turn it right around by other people's perspective Perspective, yeah by listening yeah yeah no I know there's many many times I've wanted to run screaming out of the room (laughs) just with the situation or whatever and then I remember our conversations okay. and the teaching and again that's I get to choose exactly right I get to choose how I really want to show up exactly. and and that is such that, a gift and that we're all one too we have to recognize that aspect of us of us the yeah oneness I think right and that people are reflecting back to you something in inside you which sometimes well, I don't <laughs> want to see. <laughs> right? Exactly. It's like, exactly. really? Oh, but it's, exactly. a, and it's, all, it's okay. It's okay. It's and it's enlightening to actually look at it that way because then you can change it. Right. If it was just somebody else doing something to you, then there would be nothing you could do about it. Right. But so we are using, we're using what's happening around us to inform us of how we're showing up exactly right I loved um, Oprah said once you know sometimes there's that soft whisper and then it'll get a little louder and then it's a you know and then it's a brick upside the head <laughs> if you don't listen <laughs> if exactly. you don't listen but it's exactly. so but to have people that you know love and trust that um, you can talk about those whispers mm-hmm. or those bricks mm-hmm. is uh, is what makes life um, and, worth living and Ours isn't a church, but a lot of churches can do serve that purpose for people. Yeah, it funeral services, and they get together and do things together for a divine purpose, really. So, well, with humans, with humans. Well, <laughs> on that happy note, I want to take a moment and just do a shout out to um, our sponsor, Hands on Health Chiropractic, in Brighton. Um, they just do provide amazing um, care and brilliant self-care and just you know if you just want to feel good walk in their space um, because everybody there is um, upbeat and concerned about providing an, um, an incredible um, customer service and they also have massages correct yeah they have massage and, and supplements and, and, and yeah yeah and just really exquisite care um, 
And I, I know that I used to have like back and neck pain and I, st- I went there and went through the treatments and I haven't had, I just realized I haven't had that for years now. Wonderful. And it used to be part of my story, my narrative. <laughs> so I can't um, praise uh, chiropractic care enough at Hands on Health. So on that happy note, if, is there, we like to say, is there something that you would like to say to people um, if they're looking for a place to connect or what would be your parting word of wisdom? Um, to close their eyes and go inward and listen to their own responses. So in my meditation this morning, um, she was saying, you know, sometimes people have a really hard time hearing. Mm-hmm. They're in her, she said, make it up. <laughs> Just <laughs> then make up what you want to think or feel. And, mm-hmm. and so it's kind of like Bake you're it writing. You yeah, make it. It's kind of like you're saying, I remember, I remember, because uh-huh. I don't have anything to say. So I just remember. Uh-huh. It's, it, it's a primer. Right. Fake it till you make it is the old saying. Yeah. But even Thich Nhat Hanh says, just the power of a smile. You know, breathe in. And smile. And breathe in. I'm healing. Breathe out. I smile. Breathe in. You can do it with anything. If you need patience to just stop and take a deep breath and just breathe in patience. And exhale. I smile. I smile. So it's connecting your mind to your body. Got it. Got it. Oh, that's great advice. And it works anywhere, right? And it's free. So, well, thank you so much, Mary, for being with us today. Thank you. My pleasure. And um, on that... um, yeah, we've got lots of cool things going on with Good Fat Life, and um, our website is, we have a new website, and lots of cool things coming up on it over time, so I ask you to go check out the magazine. You can get a digital copy of the magazine, or you can order it to have it show up on your doorstep. Like um, I do. Once a quarter, yeah, once a quarter, and um, anyways, and we are, we'll be doing some live events in April. Um, bring in the magazine to life. So we're really excited about that too. So, so on that happy Great. note. I love your magazine. <laughs> oh, thank you. So devour it every month uh, or every time it comes out. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. So yeah. And you're going to actually be doing some writing. Yeah. So that's, that's very cool. I can't wait yes. to read that. So on that happy note, we'll just go out and live our good fat life. Thank right? you. Okay. Okay. Sure. Bye.